Hey everyone, my name is Kieran and I'm an NBE certified POCUS enthusiast. On today's screencast, we will be talking about a phenomenon that is a lot more common than you think and that is deadly if missed, dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and intracavitary gradients. Let's start with a case. A 52-year-old male with a history of cirrhosis presents to your emergency department with fever and hypotension. He has a distended tender abdomen with tense ascites. You make the presumptive diagnosis of septic shock secondary to SBP and his blood cultures are positive for E. coli. Despite three liters of IV fluid, he remains hypotensive and you start him on a norepinephrine infusion and intubate him. However, he remains in shock and you promptly escalate his vasopressors and add inotropic support. Despite this, he has escalating vasopressor requirements and his lactate continues to increase. You decide to perform a bedside echo and see hyperdynamic LV systolic function. There is no pericardial effusion and no signs of RV failure. The astute POCUS user that you are, you try to obtain a VTI to estimate his cardiac output and get the following tracing. Why is he in refractory shock? What does your point of care ultrasound suggest? Well, let's talk about the diagnosis of dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and intracavitary gradients. It is defined as an obstruction to the normal outflow of blood from the left ventricle. Obstruction can occur at the left ventricular outflow tract itself or somewhere within the ventricular cavity. Importantly, this is a dynamic phenomenon that occurs when anatomic and or physiologic risk factors coincide with certain loading conditions. An easy way to understand this pathophysiology is to look at a case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is an anatomic risk factor for the development of dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. This picture shows a normal heart. The LVOT is outlined by the blue cylinder. In normal circumstances, blood flows through the LVOT typically at a speed of about 1.5 meters seconds or less. This image, on the other hand, shows someone with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as evidenced by the thick myocardium. As you can see, hypertrophied myocardium enroaches on the LVOT and causes it to narrow. When blood encounters an area of narrowing, it accelerates to speeds that exceed 1.8 to 2 meters per second. As blood accelerates, it creates negative pressure in the LVOT, resulting in a vacuum effect. This vacuum effect will suck in other structures into the LVOT during systole. As you can see, the structure that is closest to the LVOT is the mitral valve, especially the anterior mitral valve leaflet. Thus, the anterior mitral valve leaflet gets pulled into the LVOT during systole. This phenomenon is referred to as systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, aka SAM. The consequences of SAM are twofold. First, the mitral valve further narrows the already narrowed LVOT. This results in a worsening vacuum effect, which further pulls in the mitral valve into the LVOT. At some point, it reaches a point where the LVOT is completely blocked and blood cannot leave the left ventricle. This results in profound obstructive shock. Se Secondly, since the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets no longer coapt insistently, this leads to mitral regurgitation and therefore pulmonary edema. So how do you make this diagnosis to prevent devastating consequences for your patient? The first step is to recognize its existence and think of it when you're confronted with a case of refractory shock. The classic scenario is in a sick tachycardic patient who worsens with conventional therapy such as escalating doses of inotropes and vasopressors. As we will talk about, tachycardia and inotropy worsen dynamic LVOTO, giving the appearance of refractory shock. The second is to recognize anatomic and physiologic substrates that predispose to the development of dynamic LVOTO and mid-cavitary gradients. Anatomic substrates include any structural or functional conditions that lead to narrowing of the LVOT. There are numerous causes, and common ones include hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, left ventricular hypertrophy, and a sigmoid septum. Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy results in hyperkinesis of the LV base to compensate for the akinetic apex. This results in high velocities through the LVOT and can lead to SAM. Valve abnormalities can also predispose to LVOTO. These include subaortic membranes, elongated mitral valve leaflets, and a post-surgical anteriorly displaced mitral valve. Importantly, not all patients who develop this phenomenon have predisposing anatomic substrates. In fact, in a general critically ill population, physiologic substrates are a lot more common.
Physiologic substrates include conditions that lead to obliteration of the LV cavity and or the LVOT during systole. Hypovolemia causes a reduction in the size of the LV cavity. An impaired diastolic filling time due to a tachyarrhythmia can have the same effect. Hyperdynamic LV systolic function is a classic physiologic risk factor and can be caused by various shock states such as distributive shock or the use of inotropes. A study by Chauvet et al. showed that 20% of patients with septic shock had evidence of intracavitary gradients or LVOTO on bedside echo and this was associated with higher mortality. Next up, look for evidence of systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve leaflets. Pay close attention to the mitral valve leaflets in this clip. Notice that during systole, the mitral valve leaflets swing toward the LVOT. Slow down this video to highlight this phenomenon. Next, identify aliasing in the LVOT. Remember that aliasing on pulse wave Doppler or color Doppler occurs when the speed at which blood is traveling exceeds more than 1.8 to 2 meters per second. Blood traveling at these speeds confuse the Doppler signals, so the ultrasound machine does not know which direction and how fast blood is moving. On color Doppler, aliasing appears as light blue and yellow flow through the LVOT. On pulse wave Doppler, aliasing in the LVOT demonstrates lines without a clear VTI waveform. Continuous wave Doppler, on the other hand, can detect an infinitely high velocity and is what is used to identify the severity of valvular diseases. It is also used to quantify the gradient across the LVOT or mid-cavity in obstruction. The classic waveform that appears is that of a dagger shape. At the beginning of the curve, blood is flowing at a slower velocity. As it encounters an area of narrowing, blood accelerates rapidly until it reaches the point of obstruction at which blood flow stops abruptly. A common question that comes up is how to distinguish between aortic stenosis versus LVOTO on continuous wave Doppler. Aortic stenosis is shown on the left. Notice how the waveform is symmetric and its peak is in mid-systole. On the other hand, LVOTO has a dagger-shaped curve with a peak later in systole. The other type of continuous wave Doppler pattern you may see is that of a mid-cavity obstruction. Here, the obstruction to blood flow occurs in the middle of the left ventricle, generating a pressure gradient between the apex, which is still contracting, and the middle of the LV, which has collapsed you see a rabbit ear pattern on continuous wave Doppler. To quantify the gradient, measure the peak systolic velocity of the curve. The ultrasound machine will automatically calculate the gradient for you using Bernoulli's equation. In this case, the gradient was 36 millimeters of mercury. A gradient more than 30 millimeters of mercury is considered hemodynamically significant, while more than 50 is considered severe. Now, this does not mean that you should ignore gradients less than 30. Like tamponade, LVOTO and mid-cavitary obstruction exist on a spectrum. A gradient less than 30 with other manifestations such as worsening shock, SAM, and MR in the presence of a substrate is important enough to require treatment. Finally, identify where the obstruction is occurring, i.e. whether it is at the LVOT or somewhere in the mid-cavity of the left ventricle. To do so, walk your pulse wave Doppler signal up the LV. Start at the LVOT. As you can see here, the pulse wave Doppler tracing shows aliasing, which demonstrates high velocities and obstruction. In the mid cavity, the pulse wave Doppler signal is that of a clear envelope, and thus there is normal velocity flow in this area. Finally, at the apex, the pulse wave Doppler signal also does not demonstrate aliasing and demonstrates a clear envelope. Thus, the area of obstruction in this case was at the LVOT. Finally, once you have identified this condition, how do you manage it? As always, Treat the underlying cause or substrate that led to the development of this condition. If they have an LAD infarct leading to basal hyperkinesis, treat the infarct. If they have raging sepsis, treat it. Importantly, immediate treatment may not always be possible in cases of anatomic substrates such as hokum. Next, increase the LV preload, which increases ventricular volume. This can be accomplished by IV fluids and pure vasoconstrictors such as phenylephrine and vasopressin, both of these cause venoconstriction and thus improve venous return. Increasing the afterload is crucial, as in many patients, systemic vasodilation is the physiologic substrate that led to LVOTO and intracavitary gradients. Stop any afterload-reducing medications or therapies such as nitrates, hydralazine, and intraaortic balloon pumps.
Phenylephrine and vasopressin are your go-to vasopressors to increase the afterload. The use of norepinephrine is debated. While it acts mostly as a vasoconstrictor, its beta-1 agonism can lead to tachycardia, which worsens obstruction. Be mindful of the heart rate if you do choose to use this. Next, decrease the contractility, as this leads to hyperdynamic LV systolic function and cavity obstruction. The most important thing to do here is to stop any inotropes that may have been started during your resuscitation. Finally, consider decreasing the heart rate with a short-acting agent such as esmolol. While it may seem scary to decrease the heart rate in someone with profound shock, remember that severe tachycardia impairs LV filling during diastole, which can lead to a small LV cavity and predispose to obstruction. You may not have to get to this point, but if you have completed all the other management steps on this algorithm and the patient has still not improved significantly, I would pull out the esmolol. So there you have it, dynamic LVOTO and intracavitary gradients. I want to leave you with a few key points from this screencast. First, think about the diagnosis in cases of refractory shock or in the presence of underlying substrate. This is probably the most important step and can be applied by anyone. Even if you're not comfortable with using Doppler, recognizing that this diagnosis may be in play triggers you to seek help from colleagues and perform definitive tests to diagnose this condition. LVOTO and intracavitary gradients are a dynamic phenomenon, i.e. they are provoked by a change in physiologic conditions such as hypovolemia, tachycardia, or low afterload states. Management of this condition is unique in that your conventional treatment for shock makes these patients worse. Inopressors and inotropes such as epinephrine and dibutamine will cause worsening shock rather than improvement in hemodynamics. On the other hand, beta blockers will improve this condition. Finally, this can be a challenging diagnosis to make. It took me a while to understand the pathophysiology of this phenomenon and to recognize SAM. Thus, review this often and going to my first point, think about this diagnosis. The more you think about it, the more likely you are to pick it up. Thank you for watching. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Tarek Alansari for contributing some images to this screencast. See you next time.